you know, just how bad is the national teacher shortage. We don't realize how bad it is. Um, but Carl Ackerman, who has been uh, in academia and who has been a teacher at Punahou for years and years and years, uh, can help us appreciate that. There was an article in the Washington Post a few days ago. We're going to dwell on that a little bit. And it's very scary stuff. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure. Carl, you know, I was I was surprised that, um, you know, how, how bad this article depicted the problem. On the other hand, when I thought about it, I realized that we are all aware of the vectors. We are all aware of the causes. And we could have, should have, would have realized that all these things that have happened, uh, especially during the Trump administration, would lead to a national um, teacher shortage. Uh, can you give us a thumbnail of at least uh, from your experience and the Washington Post? First, how bad is it and, and how far does it reach? You know, um, Jay, from that article alone, you realize that almost all major school districts, um, there are some excep exceptions, like in the Fairfax County um, uh, School District in Virginia, um, which pays its teachers very well and is giving some bonuses. Um, that the teacher shortage in almost all districts, including, you know, if you're just to, to mention, you know, Houston, Los Angeles, Honolulu, as three of the examples, I mean, thing, teacher shortage, shortages are dire right now. And, you know, there, there are some place, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in Texas, where they're starting to hire college, undergraduate college students, which to me is really... Um, um, pretty dreadful. I mean, not that college students are not great people, uh, but I just don't think they have the wherewithal to be good teachers yet. Right, right. And, you know, they're trying anything. But let's, um, let's look at, um, you know, the, the geographical uh, implications of this. Seems to me, just looking at that article, and it's not a surprise, is that the, the states that have been hardest on teachers that is the states that have had issues about masks and kids uh, wearing masks. Uh, the states that have um, told teachers they could not teach certain books, those states are losing teachers um, because the teachers don't agree with the policies and the teachers feel that their efforts to educate these kids are, are being constrained and impeded and they are looking elsewhere. And, you know, guess what? you can find jobs elsewhere. So I think what I get out of it is they are moving to other states that are easier to teach in, where salaries are better, um, you know, public opinion, public attitudes and sensibilities are better. Um, and, you know, it's not a problem um, to get licensed now because it's, it's kind of a, a, a recruiting feeding frenzy around the country. Um, if, if, if one uh, state is short, it's going to raid and, and poach teachers from other states. And frankly, for that matter, uh, states that, are, that, are, that have been mean to teachers are, you know, they understand they're going to lose them. And unless that state uh, that's been mean to teachers uh, changes its policies and funding, they're going to lose their teachers. And this is the principals and so forth, the administrators, understand it and they and they say farewell um so what you have is a, a a grand migration of teachers from the states that are kind of backward about this um to the states that understand they've got to pay more and be kinder to teachers am i right about that Warren, you know jay the the big example and you and i know this directly um that if you were a new york city uh public school teacher or you are anywhere around the Boston area, um, teachers are well paid. I mean, you know, they, they are paid like other people. I mean, they don't get as much money as doctors or lawyers, but they're paid as professionals. And, you know, in other states, you know, which includes almost the entire state of Texas or, or in uh, Hawaii, um, they're not really giving a, given a, a living wage. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's part of the problem. So, you know, you begin with uh, teachers' conditions in most um, in most places being very um, on the edge anyway, and then what you throw in is you throw in COVID, and 
Um, that's a, that's a, that was a big sort of unknown. But you know, if you imagine that teaching is simply a calling, you know, to use that old Protestant uh, Max Weber um, mm -hmm. comment, um, it, it, and it is a calling. I mean, you don't go into teaching to make a lot of money. You just don't. But it, it's because you know, you're like me, you're a history guy and you want to talk about Otto von Bismarck. And I used to have my students go up on the second floor and shout out his name, Otto von Bismarck across the <laughs> campus. That's a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just because I thought he was such a, you know, interesting character in history. And, um, you know, you do this because you really like being with kids and you add COVID and you're seeing kids on screens. And then, you know, you're, you're working from home and, and, you know, you, you know, the, the great joy of every teacher is working with kids and being around kids. And if you destroy that, in addition to paying them low, in addition to, you know, making them fill out as many public uh, school districts do, fill out a, a ton of um, uh, paperwork and, you know, blame them for everything under the sun, for not being good social workers, for not taking care of, of kids who come uh, when they haven't been fed. Um, you know, then you have have problems. And let me let me say this right out front. Um, one of the best things that's going for teachers are teacher unions. Um, not all teacher unions do all the right things, you know, and there's always a problem with unions taking on fights that might not be in the best interests of, of whatever their clients are in this case as kids. And I understand all that. But it's rare that something that's good for a teacher is not good for a kid. Um, even better salaries makes a teacher more comfortable. They don't have to worry about a lot of things. And this is in the, in the long run, um, better for children. And, and, you know, you don't, <laughs> you know, you don't think of, of, of teachers being greedy because they often spend their own money, which I did my entire career, um, their own money on providing for kids, of course. And, you know, um, that was doubly true in the Puyo program. You know, if you got to take a kid home, if you got to if you have to spend money for a kid's lunch because that kid isn't getting enough to eat, that's what you do. I don't know why, but <clears throat> your story of it, that reminds me of, um, of uh, an issue that appeared in front of the neighborhood board in my neighborhood. I, I was on that board for a few years, and I remember um, the teachers came to the board and they said, you know, we, we don't have enough pens and pencils in our school. This is Hawaii, right? Right. We don't have enough pens and pencils in public schools. Uh, could you guys, you know, go through your homes and see if you have any spare pens and pencils? And can you give them to us so that we can give them to the kids? So what? you got to be kidding me. I pay some of the highest taxes in the country, and you want me to fund the pens and pencils in the schools? What's wrong with, with this picture? Well, it's bad administration. It's inefficiency. So on top of all the problems that you know, are clear and preventable, you have, the, you know, this fundamental lack of good administration. Uh, and I don't think it's limited to Hawaii at all. I think it's around the country. But, you know, <clears throat> one thing, Carl, reading that article, I thought, you know, they didn't really pay enough attention to Trump and Betsy DeVos and giving, you know, coupons for private schools in lieu of public schools. Um, and, you know, treating the, the teachers like, like dirt, especially over the COVID, <clears throat> teachers were, under Trump, politicized. They were weaponized. They were attacked um, over books, over masks, over vaccines, all these irrational things coming down on them. And they got sick and they were afraid to go to school. And parents, understandably, would do homeschooling not just because of COVID, but because the whole thing was in decline. Um, and, you know, I think it had, you tell me if you agree, I think it had a profound effect on our way of looking at public schooling in this country. And private schools became much more attractive at a time when the Department of Education, you know, was um, the national, um, was, was down on public schools and was uh, incentivizing private schools. And and so the whole thing like turned around to some extent during, um, during Trump and COVID and, and bad books and the like. And I don't think that can be fixed so easily, even in the time of Joe Biden. Your thoughts? You know, um, I had a chance to meet um, Betsy DeVos um, um, several times. And I think that she, I think that she earnestly felt 
um, that vouchers and um, private schools were the way to go. And, you know, there's been no indication that, you know, charter schools have done any better than public schools. Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen any statistical information that indicates if you send your kid to a charter school, as well as, I mean, every parent has their choice, of course, um, they're going to do better there than in public schools. And of course, we have great public schools across um, the country. I mean, if we look at our own neighborhoods, if you look at a, a public school like Kaiser, Kaiser they're only great well. with great teachers, Carl. And, if you and, lose and, the teachers, you lose the heart of it. This is this is true. And if you take good care of your teachers, but you know, even private schools, unfortunately, Jay, are getting rid of you know teacher housing, and they're getting rid of um, you know it used to be at most private schools that if you taught at a private school, your your own children would be subsidized um, greatly. And sometimes getting free tuition. I know that happened to, for me at, at Punahou School, um, but that's no longer true in a lot of cases. And so it's not just an attack on the public sector, but also on the private sector. Sector. It's you know it's like you know when you talk about the most vulnerable. Well, the most vulnerable in any school are the staff and the teachers. And you know when you start you know pulling back and um, um, uh, not allowing them to have the benefits that they deserve. You know I've I've always thought in Hawaii, for example there's a lot of land at different schools and you should probably build apartments, you know, high rise, um, you know, especially if you have a, a school like Jefferson, uh, which is right in Waikiki. Um, you should have a high rise there for teachers and you know, give them affordable housing. You know, I mean, it's, it's, this is what private schools used to do traditionally, but you know, the other thing is that I think that people who, you know, attach themselves to vouchers and things like this, are the vouchers really going to cover the 20,000 plus, maybe 25,000 now at Iolani or Punahou? Um, is, is that going to really happen? Um, and um, are you going to get the diversity of kids? I'm not just talking about um, uh, ethnic diversity. I, I think that it's really important to have socioeconomic diversity first. Um, are you really going to get that at kids? So, I mean, I think that the, in, uh, to go back to the original issue is about shortages, Jay. I really think that the shortages are a product of teachers being in vulnerable positions to begin with all the time. And then of course, as so I what does vulnerable that, mean, Carl? Well, vulnerable means that they are not paid well. Um, they're doing this because they believe uh, that they have, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a God given, if you were um, responsibility to take care of the kids and do well with the kids. Um, and then what you do with, with these people is that you pay them a very poor salary, and sometimes you take away their medical benefits and things like this. Um, so, you know, that's what I mean by vulnerable. And then you dump COVID on top where you're just seeing your kids on your computer. Then, you know, someone comes along with another job, like let's say, you know, a managerial job someplace in an office someplace. Let's say they go back to school, and become, you know, a registered nurse. You're going to get paid much better being a registered nurse than being a teacher. Um, not that, you know, those, I, it, and I think registered nurses, of course, have their own problems, but, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, or they, you know, um, um, see a business opportunity that they can follow and suddenly their salaries are doubled or tripled. That's a hard thing to fight against. And what keeps teachers in teaching is being the kind of hams that we all are, um, to wanting to talk about our subjects and also the great um, interest in in um, in having uh, you know uh, really working with kids and you know yeah motivation passion all those things you know that those things have been diminished I think that, that's my impression but you know yeah, one you thing know, is I think you know just 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 talking about the article and, and your thoughts here it seems to me these problems existed before Trump but but Trump exacerbated them Trump revealed them to us Trump revealed them to the teachers. Uh, and, and the teachers realize that the community doesn't support them the way it should. Uh, it marginalizes them not only in salary, but in general respect. And it has this strange attitude. And I mean, millions of parents out there have this strange attitude is, I'll send my kid to school and the teachers will take care of everything. It's their legal obligation. That's what I pay my taxes for. And, and I am not going to participate in the educational process they got to do it and they got to take all the trouble I hand out to them and they are marginalized in terms of my respect um, with, with, a, with a certain percentage of parents saying, I'm going to I'm going to teach my kid myself. And I do want to talk to you about that. Um, but well, don't you think that don't you think that the community in general 
somewhere along the line, and it was exacerbated under Trump, lost respect for teachers, and this is being revealed now. Well, you know, when the highest position in the land is run by someone who really is, you know, puts, you know, without getting into the politics of, of the situation, who puts front, front and center just making money being the goal. And, um, you know, not to say that's bad. It's not, it's not bad under capitalism. You know, you want to make money and you want to live comfortably. Uh, but, but without any regard for teachers and then to have a secretary of education who was, you know, who earnestly wanted to do better for kids. But, you know, basically, um, if she could have, she probably would have destroyed public education in the United States, uh, Betsy DeVos, even though um, I think that she deeply cared about kids. But, you know, the public school means you go for free and you pay through, through it through, through our collective notion of taxes. And there are many great teachers and great schools in our country um, that are a product of, of public education. I, I can think of my sister in Los Angeles who has the Girls Academic Leadership Academy, which is an all girls public school focused on STEM that, that primarily caters to kids on free or reduced lunch, which means they're, they have no challenges economically, obviously. And all these kids go on to college because you know my sister's a good administrator, she hires good teachers and she supports them. And I think the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, rule of thumb is that from my experiences, I also taught at Iolani, where I experienced the greatest administrator um, ever, and that was uh, David Kuhn. And David Kuhn was an Episcopal minister, and he's, his, his, his motto was that you know, he hired good people and let them do what, he, what they needed to do. And he paid them well. And, you know, and, and the, you know, there was a good sort of uh, medical plan, dental plan, and, and uh, retirement plan. And Ooh, so, private schools can do that. And I yeah. think the needle has shifted uh, in right. Hawaii, for sure. I mean, we have private schools that are mm, way better than public schools, uh, and uh, and that it'll continue that way in other places too. Um, if you want your kid to live a pri privileged life, send them to a privileged school, and then you won't have teacher mm, pay shortages and the like, and they'll be treated with greater respect. Now, I come from the public school um, system in New York. Uh, which I considered in those days excellent. I'm not sure what it is today. It's been a long time. But uh, all of my friends went to public school. The private school was just not, not on the radar. Uh, I, I can't even tell you about the private schools that were worth going to. Uh, and then I went to a um, uh, public uh, college, which was excellent at the time. And it was the City University of New York City. Uh, if you want, I can sing you the song, but I'll hold up on that. Uh, well, in any event, we all loved public schooling. It was challenging. The teachers were dedicated. Uh, New York City, as you said before, had a very high priority on teaching. Why? Because it was a melting pot of immigrants. And people understood very clearly well that if you want to have a decent life, you got to do, you got to get educated. And uh, and so they made the government provide those, you know, those experiences for kids. And that went on for as long as I know in New York City. Um, not all communities have had that benefit. And some of these communities now that are, you know, shedding their teachers and sending their teachers away, allowing their teachers to be recruited out from under them, which is happening in the very same states that are going red, uh, you know, in uh, that are red, uh, you know, in, in the political news, um, those, those, they don't have the same attitude. And they're, and, and, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about here in the last few minutes of our show. So I'm giving you a national demographic, Carl. Um, I'm, I'm giving you, uh, who did you quote before? Was it uh, Weber? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's really important that, that uh, it's like a great state uh, has great art, you know? but a great state also has great education. And if you don't provide great education, you don't have a citizenry that can make good choices in terms of voting, which is the most important thing we do in our civic connection to government. Um, and thus, government will not be as good. So if I give you a, a state that's not teaching critical thinking, that doesn't care about educating kids, 
uh, then I'm going to give you a state that doesn't vote very well and doesn't have a government that is uh, responsible and accountable. Uh, and I think that's what's happening. And we see it to some extent here, but uh, other states, uh, it's much more. I mean, imagine a state where they vote for people who, uh, who go to the legislature and turn the up election upside down. What's that about? And that's a failure of education, of civics education, of understanding the duty of a citizen, the way the government works. Um, and if you don't have teachers, that gets worse. And homeschooling is not going to cover it. Uh, I guess before we go to the larger macro, what do you think about homeschooling? Is it a, a viable alternative in the lack of teachers? You know, Jay, I, and I will go again in September, I always go to the private school conference. And I think that, you know, people who homeschool, in, in one sense, um, homeschooling, what it does is it provides a venue for parents who want to do this. It takes an enormous amount of energy. Um, and, you know, um, and I think that, that people who do this have a, you know, have a bent, whether it's a religious, I think most often it's a religious bent. They want to, their kids to be exposed to a different, a single religion that they believe in. And I, that's, that's okay. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, that's their right. And I, I, I understand that, but I think they could get just as good an education in a public school. And like you, I'm a pu product of uh, public schools all the way along. And I think that, you know, if you take your kid, the, the problem with homeschooling is, uh, and it's a big problem, is unless you have your kids in a lot of um, uh, things like soccer and activities like this, they're not going to get the kind of socialization, good or bad, uh, that you uh, get in, um, in elementary school and junior high school and high school. I mean, imagine you missing all your friends from elementary school, junior high school and high school and all the things that you did in these areas. I mean, it's a certain uh, point of making you a better cultural uh, person. And I, I lament um, for my own daughters who went to a, a K through 12 private school because I was teaching at the school, um, their ability to socialize and to get along with everyone, not that they don't, they do, uh, but they didn't have this exposure. They didn't have the exposure that you and I had in a public school where some kids would come you know, with a key around their neck because you know uh, it was only grandma and grandpa that were taking care of them. They were off working and they had to go home and open the door for themselves. And make well, the, pro the problem with, with public school, as you described with uh, homeschooling, is that is it's an echo chamber, as you're you're you know you're bouncing off your your parents' um, thought process, their level of education, and they're not really qualified to be teachers and to impart to you the the kind of um, thought process that a school at least theoretically, is uh, able to impart to you. Uh, I agree about the socialization, the, the diversity. You need, if you're going to go out into the world soon enough, you better get along with everybody. You better understand different groups. But if you only have the echo chamber at home, you're missing that, and you're not really prepared. I suppose there are, are homeschool situations which are you know, better than others. But I, and in general, I think a lot of parents who believe that they are qualified to teach homeschool or not qualified to teach homeschool. What's more interesting even is that now with COVID and mass and vaccines and, and shootings and killings, it's terrorism. You know, it can happen five states away, but you are nevertheless terrified. It's going to happen in your school down the block. So you're afraid to send your kid there. And so uh, a reasonable parent would say, I'm going to do this at home. I'm going to do homeschooling, even if it's not really completely qualified to do it. I want my kid to be safe and alive, and I don't want him to be subject to this. And I, and I have no confidence in government to protect them there. No confidence at all. Um, you know, we have these Second, second Amendment nut issues. Uh, we have these, these people who need mental health who walk around with assault rifles, and we let them do that, and then they shoot our kids. Why, why should I, uh, you know, and the teachers the same way. Why should I be in a place where I could get killed? It's a target, a, tar a target on my back. In addition to all the other problems teachers suffer and the lack of respect and, 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 and reasonable salaries and, um, you know, all the, all the trouble the parents give teachers, uh, in addition, they're at risk for their lives. So if I were a teacher, Carl, I would retire immediately. If I were a teacher, I'd go to another state where they were recruiting me with much better benefits and attitude and I think that's happening. 
And, and thus the question that I began to pose earlier is very relevant. What happens in a nation of 330 million people where our schools are declining rapidly in front of our eyes because of government, because of all these social problems that we haven't fixed, the divisiveness, what have you, the, the guns, the, the, the economic issues, um, the lack of respect. What happens in a, in a country of 30, 330 million people where we don't have qualified teachers to teach our children? And P.S., it's getting worse. What happens in that country? I, I, I think, Jay, I think you touched on a, on a, on a key point here. And, um, uh, uh, you know, the country dissolves. Actually, that's the answer to your question. Um, but I think that, you know, what's important is that we have to get back to a sense of um, letting the teachers teach what they need to teach. And, you know, I think it's extraordinarily important that teachers are allowed to teach um, U.S. history. Um, in the manner that they think is appropriate. I mean, they should teach about the presidents. They should teach about the Civil War. They should teach, you know, the great, the great thing that I keep, think keeps people on par with what should be uh, taught are, are um, advanced placement tests that give kids little, you know, when they get into later in high school, I think advanced placement tests are good. So I think that, you know, um, and people should be able to teach what they, what they teach. And now, you know, um, unfortunately, um, education has been politicized in this way. People are starting to say you can't teach that and you can't teach this. And, you know, I think always think of having taught Russian history in, in high school for many years. You know, what if someone were to come along and say, well, that Fyodor Dostoevsky, he, you know, he was an anti-Semite, so you shouldn't use his books. Well, you know, he produced really great literature and, you know, people in the 19th, century, especially the late 19th century across Europe, some of them were anti-Semites. And so, but do you throw the, you know, the, the do you throw out everything because of someone's political or uh, ideological? Well, yeah, framework? look at the whole critical race theory debate. I should, debate is too elevated beyond where it should be. Um, look at that, telling a teacher he can't or she cannot discuss a given subject, even though it's a clear established part of American history and culture. It happened. It is the reality. It is the fact. And you as a teacher are told that you can't teach it. And if you do teach it, we're going to come and get you and prosecute you already. Uh, that, is, that is really out of the 30s in Germany. Um, it's book burning is what it, it literally is book burning. And, I, you know, it's not just that you can't teach uh, critical race theory is that the government can come, this is like First Amendment, the government, and usually state government, can come and tell you what you can teach, what you can't teach, what books you can discuss, what books you can't discuss. It's not just a critical race theory, it's everything. If I were a teacher, I would say, how dare they do that to me? I'm trying to open these minds, and they're telling me to close these minds. Well, and, you know, Jay, uh, let me just I'll make a concluding comment to you about this. And uh, by the way, uh, I have to interject that, you know, uh, our new superintendent is Keith Hayashi, and uh, he came from a big public high school in Waipapu, and he did marvelous things with the kids in terms of getting kids into little academies and getting them working um, in you know, future professions, whether that's as chefs or as nurses. So I have great hope for the next uh, four or five years with with uh, Superintendent Hayashi, I, I really I really do. Um, I know he's a, I know where his heart is, and it's in a good place. And hopefully, that that feeling will trans transition into into some good work. But let me just go back to the notion of critical race theory and be very brief about this. But to also um, say this: that's just that's that's a phenomenon. The discussion of it is just ignorant. Um, I, I just think that that that's taken this this one specific type of ideology that sometimes comes out of, and it's true what the Republicans say, that sometimes you have these ideologues at universities that are far off to the left. And okay, I get that. But that's not what, pe what, what, what teachers are teaching. And, and you know, if you look at the history of, for African-Americans in this country that were basically held as slaves, you know, until, you know, um, 1860, 1880 into the into the uh, not even being freed in um, 1860 um, 1863, but it basically being um, 
uh, kept the slaves until the end of the Civil War, and then um, having some rights and then all those rights overturned and then having Jim Crow laws and then having lynchings. And only in the early 1960s being able to have some sort of equal access to education, of course, with that famous 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education. And you know, with all that legacy, can you say that in 2022, everyone's on an equal footing and we shouldn't discuss that history? Of course, we should discuss that history and how, you know, uh, during the, you know, during the um, actually occupation of land that was held by Mexico or Spain or, you know, the taking over of Native American lands. All of this is true. Now, can we go back into, you know, and, and dissolve things? No, I don't think we should. But we should know the, the, you know, the legitimate history and historians are always doing this. You know, you want to find out what really came before and change your monograph or change your books to reflect the newest historical findings. I mean, it's, it's, this is a whole nonsense argument that the right has put up and that Republicans have put up. They are right in saying that critical race theory should, you know, probably is too advanced for anybody below college level kids. Of course, of course, no one's arguing that. But to teach history um, in a proper way, and also uh, I may add that, you know, we should celebrate George Washington. We should celebrate Thomas Jefferson. We should celebrate Abraham Lincoln. But the former two presidents owned slaves, and we should point out their errors. I mean, is it, that's not hard to do. I mean, you know, if you're race, if you're, race is the biggest social issue in the country, and how can you turn your back on the history of it? That's an extraordinary. And you know, and what I get out of this, though, Carl, and I, I mean, I'd like to right. ask you one more, one more level of things here. Let, let's take a hypothetical state, okay? And I'm, you know, you and I can pick a few. It wouldn't be hard to find one <laughs> <laughs> that fits the profile. Here's a state that, uh, you know, uh, we, we're going to outrule, uh, outlaw ab abortion fast as we can in all ways. Uh, we're going to dump on teachers. We, we're going to dump on critical race theory. Um, we're, we're not going to pay them very well. We're going to lose them. They're going to they're going to leave. And, and we're going to have a, a, another kind of population. Poor people cannot afford to go to other states for an abortion. So they they have the kids. And if that's what you want from your religious point of view. You have a lot of poor families having kids who will be poor and not educated. And there was one article in the paper recently that pointed out that the very same states that are arguing for, well, that are mm. making abortion illegal are not providing additional social benefits, you know, social safety net benefits to the parents that, or the women who are forced to have these children. So they have more children, but they have the same or less benefit. I mean, think about that, what, what that does on a demographic basis. So my hypothetical state has more people, less educated. And, and of course, if they're smart, they'll leave the state. But a lot of them will not leave the state for economic reasons. They'll stay there. They'll, they'll suffer through it. Um, and over time, that state and many like it, um, we'll, 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 we'll be way behind the states that have attracted the teachers, way behind the states that have allowed a full discussion of American history in their classrooms and civics, you know, and government and, and Max Weber. <laughs> well, you know, um, Jay, and that will give us further divisiveness. What I'm saying is that divisiveness creates a situation where we get more divisiveness more of a, of, a, of a divide. And, and I think that's where the country is heading. Uh, so when you have you know, divisiveness beginning more divisiveness, where do you go with this? You have two countries that are even more accentuated, more different than they are today. Well, you know, let me just begin where, where you began, Jay. You know, um, this whole abortion issue is, you know, <laughs> I, you know, first of all, I'm not a medical doctor, although I do volunteer at, a, at a, one of our large hospitals here in Hawaii. And um, my, my feeling about this is that, you know, this is really another one of these questions that's sort of absurd because what this really comes down to is what a physician and a client, um, their client, their patient, 
um, has to decide because it's a medical condition. Being pregnant is a medical condition. And as far as I'm concerned, I try to not get in the way, nor do I think anyone should get in the way between a doctor and their patient. I mean, I think that's really kind of craziness um, on, the, on the first level. And, um, and, you know, whether life begins where, I, you know, that's, a, that's besides the issue. I, I think that I understand why people have concerns here, but I think that the, what the doctor and the patient should determine between them is what's good for the patient in terms of survivability and what's good in the, in the long run um, for the patient. I mean, that's, that's, that's where this nucleus should be. And it's, it's gotten lost in um, a lot of other things, but I think you're right. I think the same states that don't provide for education and for teachers also don't provide for other things. And what's, what's happening is those kids in, in the neighborhoods that you grew up in, Jay, and that are around Boston et cetera, and some East Coast cities that have very good educational um, standards for their kids, and then New York is one of the best, um, those kids are well-educated and you could still get a great um, education, not only in New York, but in California too. There are, there are um, city colleges, there are state colleges, there are universities, and for in-state people, a lot of it is affordable still. Um, the University of California is getting more expensive, but still for a lot of other places, the state system, the junior college system is very affordable. And so, you know, um, so we're getting two tracks. And if you don't allow people to have education, I mean, the whole basis of our democracy and our constitutional framework is based on people, you know, well-educated and literate um, a group of people. And um, I think that both from the right and from the left, um, people should allow people to be educated and especially educated in US history and civics. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong uh, with celebrating um, um, US history and saying that this is a great country and we have problems. Uh, but people can um, people can uh, have the ability to better themselves. You know, I still believe in the American dream, although it's becoming harder for people. Um, and I, I I think that you know we should you know we should celebrate our Constitution, we should celebrate our Bill of Rights, we should celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. and Cesar Chavez and um, all the people who have have fought for really extending these rights to other groups of people who, uh, where they may have been denied. Oh, one uh, thing, one thing seems clear, Carl. Well, you know, this, these revelations that the GOP has had in the past few years, uh, these policies that it has adopted and forced on others um, are missing one important element. And it, it becomes clear from that article, it becomes clear from our discussion today that they're missing caring for the children. They're missing caring for the children as those who will, those who have the future in their hands, those who will take our society to the next generation, to the next decade even. Um, and, and, and the GOP seems to have forgotten that. They don't care. They don't care about the safety of the classroom. They don't care about the education of the kids. They don't care about the safety of the kids against pandemics. Um, so what, what I get out is, is this extraordinary gap, you know, the political consciousness of the GOP organizations and individuals. They have forgotten about the kids. And that is, is a lethal dose in a democracy. What do you think? I, I think that's true. And I think that, you know, if you stop with this you know, um, bashing of books and, and bashing of critical race theory and leave that stuff alone because it's not really producing anything good. And instead you talk about how private schools and public schools can partner like in the Poyo program or the Kai program here in Hawaii um, and how to better kids' futures and, and basically you know, really in, improve um, education for kids and you know, allow them to um, do great things. And I mean, you know, it's not just you know, there have been um, social reformers um, who have tried to, you know, pump money into education, but they pump money in it. And, and then the money has gone mostly to educational administrators as opposed to getting to the child. And these programs I mentioned, Kai uh, and Pueo, there was a high percentage of the money that got to the kids, that, that, that money was spent on education and teachers and classes for the kids. And that's where I think we, we can have some um, great improvement with public-private 
partnerships. And that was a Betsy DeVos idea, but that's a good one. But you don't attack public education. I mean, you and I are products of uh, K through doctorates, uh, U of law, me in history, of public education all the way through. And it was a wonderful um, uh, public education. And I, you know, I, 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 I savor the fact that I was able to attend the University of California, Berkeley, which is a public institution. And it's a great one. And all of our institutions could be great like this. And, you know, in, in, um, in Hawaii, we have uh, Kaiser High School, which is a very good public high school. And the, the point is that um, we, uh, going back to what you said about parents is that, you know, when I ran um, the Poyo program, what was clear to me is that if parents are invested in their children's education. And that means showing up at PTA meetings. And it means, you know, um, focusing on what a kid is learning, you know, um, and, and this is true of many immigrant families in Hawaii and also in the rest of the part of the United States, um, then the kids succeed. And so I think we have to draw on entire communities, but we can't, as you mentioned, if you represent a Republican administration and you don't give teachers money or, and you start to, um, you know, demand certain things of teachers while taking away great salaries, while ta I mean, while taking away salaries that, that are, are approaching medium level and you start to withdraw all these things for teachers, well, uh, of course you're gonna have a teacher shortage because teachers can't survive everything, you know? And if you keep dumping on teachers, that's the issue. And well, you know, there's another part of it too. I just want to mention, it just occurred to me from what you're saying. Okay, A, teachers are moving. They're, they're moving from state to state. Mm -hmm. And the, and where the shortage is most uh, accentuated is, is where the states have lost teachers to other states, uh, which offer better recruiting packages. No, no surprise. But there's, there's the person who is in school and who is making career choices. He was saying, let's see, what can I do with my life? <clears throat> you know, and in your day and mine, uh, we could say, look, I, I, I would like to teach kids. I would like to improve their lives and give them um, uh, the prospect of doing better than their parents did. You know, the old immigrant diversity prospect. Um, but that's not happening. I mean, it's that, would you ever move to one of those X states I mentioned uh, if you cared about your kids, e born or unborn? No. And if you were a corporation thinking of relocating or adding a unit in some state like that, you'd have to consider that people, executives, especially uh, middle management, are not going to come to that state because that state is not a good state for kids, for educating their kids. So, I mean, it has all kinds of secondary implications to our society. And who in his right mind these days would choose, I'm sorry to say this, Carl, I know you've invested your whole life in it. Who in his right mind these days uh, would invest his education, his time, his future, his career, his economic success in education? Maybe not so many as before. Carl, we're out of time. We got to go now, but we'll come back because this, you know, particular discussion, you know, leads to all kinds of other issues. Uh, so uh, there's more to come, Carl. Thank you, Jay. And so again, it's always a, a pleasure working with you. And, uh, you know, you, you always rise to the knighthood of menshood. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Jay. Thank you, Carl. Dr. Carl Ackerman, really appreciate you coming on the show. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.